Hello everybody and welcome to a vlog presentation provided by the Morris County Historical Society. My name is Kat Grilko and I'm a research assistant here at the Society and today I will be discussing our most recent blog which has been turned into this vlog, Frogs in Our Faucets, a riveting history of Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. Now, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey is a community known for its collection of beautiful homes designed in the arts and crafts style. First conceived in 1908, the idea to build a town amidst the swamps of New Jersey was formed by land surveyor Louis Van Duyn and developer Herbert J. Hapgood. Herbert J. Hapgood, in and of himself, was quite an interesting character, so we'll begin by discussing him. So, as you can see here, he graduated Dartmouth in 1896 and went on to found Hapgood's Inc., the National Organization of Brain Brokers. He unfortunately did not end up succeeding in a few of his earlier ventures, and when I say not succeeding, well, from the next bullet point, you can see how on July 3rd, 1908, the New York Times noted that Hapgood was arrested on a swindle charge and held for $10,000 worth of bail. Luckily, he was eventually released and cleared of all charges and went on to develop Shoreham, Long Island. Now, Shoreham, Long Island is a community that is much smaller than Mountain Lakes, and his uh, wife and children actually ended up living in Shoreham, Long Island. After this venture, this small successful venture, he went on and decided to develop Mountain Lakes. So let's talk about that. The town was promoted, and that is Mountain Lakes by the way, to New York City dwellers as an oasis free of mosquitoes and complete with all of man's latest conveniences. However, the story of its development, along with accounts of its colorful citizens, add to the history of this suburban borough. You'll see here how there were promotions describing electric lighting, asphalt roads, and an artesian water system alongside gorgeous natural scenery, and it was promoted to the average person, and eventually even actors from the stage and screen settled in Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. So, moving on from this, the area actually became quite lively with the Mountain Lakes News, the local newspaper, reporting on social events. The paper even reported a halt to water-centric activities in 1917 after it was reported that one of Major Clarence W. Smith's pet alligators, which he had brought home after working on the Panama Canal, had escaped into Mountain Lake thus making all waterways off-limit to bathers until the rascally reptile could be recaptured. So let's look at this article, and I quote, Bathing safe again. The large alligator, which escaped from Major Smith's goldfish pond, was discovered by Edward Baker while out in a canoe and after some difficulty and with the assistance of Raymond Thorpe and Norman Van Gelder, finally landed him and returned him to his owner. Mr. Smith now has both alligators tied up. Mrs. Clarence W. Smith entertained informally Tuesday afternoon for her young guests, Mrs. Marie Conklin and Dorothy Howard. Those invited were the Mrs. Doremus, Mrs. Wilson, Mrs. Bave, Mrs. Heinrich, Ms. Browning, Ms. Keene, Ms. Nelson, and Mrs. Kramer." End quote. You can really note from this article just how casually this was uh, finished off. And I suppose this was meant to promote just how safe the area was again now that the alligator had been recaptured. You'll note that Mr. Smith had both of his alligators tied up, implying that he had more than one in his possession and that they were living outside in a goldfish pond. The Mountain Lakes Historical Society actually even has a recollection of this account provided by one of its residents. So this story is from Mountain Lakes citizen R.J. Bose who grew up in Mountain Lakes. Quote, the story I recall hearing in the Mountain Lakes history section of Mrs. Corinda's fourth grade class in 1968 
was that Major Smith had worked on the Panama Canal as an engineer and had brought the baby alligator back to Mountain Lakes with him, which would have been 1915 or so, to keep as a pet. He lived on the boulevard and the beast escaped into Mountain Lake one summer, rendering the big lake, the canal, and Wildwood Lakes off limit to bathers until the rascally reptile was recaptured as related in the newspaper." End quote. Wow, that is, that is intense right there. So, this particular article states that the rascally reptile was recaptured in the canal one week before the 4th of July. So, I suppose this story has a happy ending after all. You'll note the picture over on the right hand side of the screen is of a little girl with a tethered up baby alligator. Now, this isn't a local mountain lakes photograph or anything like that, but it should be noted that having pet alligators, while not necessarily common, wasn't out of the realm of possibility in this time period, because not only had uh, the Major gotten to the uh, Panama Canal and gotten these alligators, but you could actually order alligators, baby alligators, via uh, articles and ads and have them shipped directly to your home even as far out as the 1950s. There's actually even a Leave it to Beaver episode regarding this, and the first reported, uh, at least in the New York Times, the first reported alligator in a sewer sighting was actually in Kearney, New Jersey in 1907. So again, an escaped alligator, not out of the realm of possibility. Moving on. It was, however, soon realized that Hapgood could not keep his promotion promises. By 1911, houses still didn't have lawns as pickaxes continuously turned up enough boulders and stones to, and I quote, build the pyramids, end quote. The charmingly named dirt roads formed ruts so large that one man, guided only by the light of a neighbor's kerosene window lamp, borrowed a phone to cancel his sleeper car reservation because he had fallen into a ditch on the way to the trolley. By 1917, the situation continued to worsen as citizens fought against a plague of Caseta that had taken over the community, bothering not only with their presence, but with their incessant buzzing. Leading into the 1920s, the promised electric streetlights were still not installed and streets remained unpaved. The beautiful lakes were found to be filled with tree stumps that, for the first few summers, drove prospective buyers back to the hills from the overpowering stench of rot and decay. Those same stumps, years later, continued to force citizens to navigate an invisible maze that made rowing a, quote, never-ending adventure, end quote. Even the artesian water system was not what it promised to be. Citizens reported tadpoles and frogs emerging from their faucets leading to the discovery that water came from a scummy, mosquito-infested pond, much like the ones that formed in people's front yards and basements after almost any downpour. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? <laughs> so, financially and socially ruined, Herbert Hapgood escaped to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1922, and still dodging creditors, departed to Sydney, Australia, where he died in 1929. After his departure, the community was actually still faithful to the original vision of a modern community in nature and became an independent municipality in 1924. The borough was eventually able to uphold the previously made promises to its citizens and even chose to welcome back Hapgood's wife and children. Today, the community takes pride in the borough's unique character and embraces the rich, interesting history of its pioneer days. So we're going to end it there, and I hope that this vlog presentation has been insightful for some of you. If you guys have any comments, feel free to leave them down below. If you like this video, please give us a like, and feel free to subscribe for more vlogs. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. With that, I hope that you guys have a lovely day.